Jotaro Kujo is not impressed. You know why he's not impressed? Because according to my metrics, a whopping 75.5% of viewers have not pushed that subscribe button for the New World Review, thus granting you regular JoJo content uploaded straight into your YouTube feed. Although actually, you know, to be fair, even if you did press that subscribe button, well then Jotaro is still completely unimpressed. It takes something really special to grab this man's attention, like say a schoolboy or a rat. Hello and welcome to the New World Review, your source for everything anime and manga, and today I'm going to dive as deeply as I can into the existence and evolution of a certain Jotaro Kujo. And I'm delving into this because it can be a very popular idea to call Mr. Kujo a fairly flat protagonist, especially in his own part three, and I will admit, I myself am incredibly guilty of having done just that. Although for the most part, I do still kind of stand by it, despite the fact that this video will attempt to completely dispel that, because it really is not a fair blanket statement to make at all, as within the context of the entirety of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, Jotaro undergoes some pretty incredible growth and changes as the most recurring Jojo in the series, with his involvement spanning 23 years of his life from his formative teens all the way into true adulthood. And as such, the developments he makes are not to be underestimated, and when going through the series, I always found myself most excited to see how Jotaro had changed between parts. Actually, we do have quite a full picture of him, much more so than most protagonists actually, with the possible exception of his grandfather Joseph. But when I think about characters like, say, Josuke or Jono, I always find it a bit of a shame that they didn't carry over, and we really didn't get to see another phase of their lives like we do with Jotaro. All we really had was that condensed experience of their own series, and I mean, just think about it, quite frankly, being able to see Jono a decade on in his life would be pretty damn phenomenal. However, coming back to Jotaro, we can of course start with the brief little bits we know about his childhood, which actually paints a fairly generic picture. He was a very joyous young lad who lived on a fairly decent sized property, and it doesn't appear that he experienced a whole lot of hardship in his early years. There was lots of time for him to play, and he engaged in very his co-curricular activities like track and field. And like any good child, his favorite food was his mother's home cooking. The one detracting feature we can really identify though is his father, Sadal, who was a fairly successful jazz musician. But as a result of that, he was placed in the artist dilemma where to pursue his craft professionally, he needed to be away from his family for extended periods. And as such, in this case, Sadal is almost always on tour playing his music, which is why we don't even have so much as a single image of him in the series. So this did leave Jotaro to be raised by his mother, Holly, and that went quite well for a while, but you know how teenagers can be and puberty hit Jotaro pretty damn hard, just as with most members of the Joestar family. And as such, Jotaro turned into a delinquent and in fact, his very first line in the series consists of telling his mother to shut up while Jotaro himself was in prison for beating up a cohort of gang members. So already Jotaro has undergone quite an evolution from his childhood to the beginning of Stardust Crusaders where we find him at the age of 17. And what we as an audience are faced with initially is a radically different protagonist. In many ways, Jotaro begins as an anti-Jonathan style presence. Whereas Jonathan was a gentleman at all times, Jotaro has very little regard for the intricacies of polite society or even those of basic manners. However, I will say that this characterization did shift pretty radically. As soon as he was, let's say, released from prison and informed of the situation regarding Dio, as well as having his mother's life thrown into peril, Jotaro became our significantly more familiar part three figure, a very stoic, serious, and no nonsense existence. Generally highly focused and extremely analytical for a 17 year old, unless of course a particular stand plot calls for him not to be that way, in which case he becomes unfathomably negligible. In addition to this, he also came to terms with his own stand star platinum very quickly and just seemed to instinctively have a mastery over it, which is fine, given the nature of what stands are. Although one of my personal criticisms would be that with Jotaro starting the series effectively already in God mode, it left very little opportunity to develop him in this regard until of course we reach the finale of part three. But something we should also note is that despite everything we've seen thus far, Jotaro was by nature, a very caring and considerate young man, very aware and even protective of those around him. And one of the greater examples of this was when the Crusaders encountered Steely Dan, who held the lover's stand. And for the sake of his grandfather's life, Jotaro repeatedly humiliated himself at Dan's mercy. But crazily enough, Jotaro also developed quite a bit of respect for his enemies, or at least some of them. And he even went so far as to provide and duel with a burial following his defeat and subsequent suicide. But the thing about part three Jotaro that often leaves people, including me, wanting just that little bit more is almost certainly Jotaro's completely unemotive nature. His character arc is very, very subtle and arguably completely overshadowed by every other member of the Crusaders, including Iggy actually. But if I had to sum up Jotaro's journey in a simple sentence, then it would be something along the lines of developing an understanding of the bonds of humanity. Jotaro is introduced as a very lonely existence. As I mentioned before, his father is always gone and Jotaro doesn't really have any friends. And the people who are most attracted to him are fawning fangirls who remind him far too much of his doting mother. 
So what Jotaro is presented with in Stardust Crusaders is the opportunity to develop male bonds for the first time, both familial and friendly. With the former, Jotaro is able to develop a strong relationship with his grandfather Joseph, to the point where Joseph's quote unquote death elicits the greatest emotional response I think we've ever seen from Jotaro. And while I wouldn't go so far as to call Joseph a role model in the traditional sense, he does guide Jotaro through this adventure, even if Jotaro is more often than not the one who ends up saving him. And in regards to the rest of the group, Jotaro has to very much find his place with each respective member. You can very much look at it from the perspective of a boy learning how to make friends for the first time. So the evolution is incredibly clear in part three. In the beginning, Jotaro is a lonely, self-sufficient existence. However, by the end, he has learned to open himself up to others and value human relationships. I mean, just look at this. He even has this group hug thing going on with Joseph and Polnareff. And really, I just could never imagine this Jotaro ever engaging in something like that. So look, yes, it is a slow burn. A very slow, subtle, and sometimes frustrating burn, but Jotaro's character arc is definitely present. And that is something that I am very much going to consider from now on with my own criticisms of part three. But moving on to some even greater leaps and bounds for Jotaro, we move into part four, Diamond is Unbreakable. And by this stage, about 11 years have passed since the end of Stardust Crusaders, and you can immediately tell that Jotaro is almost an entirely new person, just judging by aesthetics alone. While he is still in keeping with his general style, Jotaro is now much more schmick as opposed to his sloppy delinquent look. Everything about this Jotaro looks organized to perfection. You know, there's no more belt straps hanging loose or tangible cues of strength like a giant gold chain. This guy is a fully formed adult who exudes confidence and maturity on a level that never would have been possible for his teenage incarnation. Although quite notably in the manga, Jotaro initially retains his absurdly bulky Joestar build, as does Josuke actually, but Araki pretty quickly goes on to evolve his art style into more slim builds. But by this point, Jotaro is also an established oceanographer, which is pretty wow. I'm not sure what kind of career path I would have expected him to go down, but he wholeheartedly stepped into the world of academia, which is simply fascinating, given that we originally knew him as a school delinquent, quite a shift there. But what carries over very strongly from the end of part three is Jotaro's sense of familial bonds, which is very very evident when he meets Tomoko for the first time and vows to protect her from the dangers that were about to hit Morio, as well as very willingly taking Josuke under his wing, in both cases, acting like the figure that Joseph should have been, except that by this point, he's just a little bit too old. But what really strikes me about part four Jojo is that he has evolved into a leader. Part three Jotaro may have been confident, intelligent, and supremely powerful, but I would certainly never characterize him as a leader. However, upon arriving in Morio, Jotaro provides a natural rallying figure capable of concocting and implementing grand courses of action, as well as giving very valuable advice. His sheer maturity is off the charts, although he hasn't changed entirely. He is still a very blunt and often curt individual who prefers to remain silent, although he is now much more willing to express his own opinion on various matters. And I guess he also doesn't swear quite as much. So there is that. And with that, we can briefly move into Golden Wind, which occurs roughly two years after Diamond is Unbreakable in the year 2001. And there isn't too much that you can gauge from his very short tenure in part five, but his aesthetic sense of certainly evolve somewhat, although he still maintains his predominant scheme from part four. I would say that he appears slightly more ornate though, although the difference is far more pronounced in the anime than it is in the manga. What is most evident in part five Jotaro though, and this is not to be understated, is that his trust has once again evolved. This time to the point where he entrusts Koichi with an incredibly important mission of finding and attaining a DNA sample of Haruno, aka Jono, and Jotaro does this because he believes that Koichi and his stand are better suited for the task than he would be. And not only that, but he legitimately trust Koichi to get the job done. And then of course, there's the ever brilliant moment of Jotaro reminiscing of his former comrades because by now he is effectively the last one left. Iggy, Avdol and Kakyoin have passed away. Joseph is assumedly still alive, but in no real condition to do anything. And by this point, Polnareff had disappeared. So I think it's just a really nice touch to see that Jotaro still treasures these relationships that he formed in his late teens. But with that, let's take a big leap into the future once again to examine part six, Stone Ocean. And if you haven't read Stone Ocean and you don't want spoilers, then please do feel free to skip to this time in the video. But honestly, no examination of Jotaro would be complete without delving into this part. So here we go. Immediately, you will of course notice that his style has radically shifted again. And to be clear, Jotaro is 40 years old by this point. And in many ways, you can argue that he has stylistically regressed into a more refined version of his part three look. Obviously, it still retains a sense of his evolution with elements of white, but all in all, Jotaro now chooses to dress far more informally with a fairly basic shirt, letting his belt hang out again, and even reintroducing his trademark chain. So what has happened to cause this shift? I mean, in his personal life, Jotaro remains an accomplished adult. And in fact, I 
believe he has even become a professor by this point, signifying his great progress in the realm of academia. However, we have a brand new stage of his life to examine because now Jotaro has a daughter, Jolene, as well as an ex-wife. And his relationship with Jolene is, uh, I guess it's strained to say the least, with Jotaro being a very absentee father, which I find absolutely fascinating, given that Jotaro's own father was always away from home. So Jotaro has very much followed his own father's parental style there and has come full circle, which may be very good cause to call back a more part three style look. Jotaro is no longer presented as the mature leader that epitomized his presence in part four and five. Here, he does evoke a more neglectful delinquent look once again, and that is a great lens to see him through because it helps us characterize Jotaro from Jolene's point of view, rather than what we as an audience know of him from previous parts. And so I don't think it should be a huge surprise that Jolene has become just as much, if not more of a delinquent than Jotaro was himself around her age. And so Jotaro's arc in part six is more about Jolene discovering why he was constantly absent and coming to the conclusion that it was because he was protecting her and that he always treasured his daughter, which is very much the climax of Jotaro's overall arc in Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. In part three, he learns to form bonds. In parts four and five, he learns to cultivate them. Then in part six, we tackle Jotaro attempting to protect those bonds, especially the profound love he has for his daughter, which is arguably the strongest bond that he has in the entire series. It's a very intriguing journey, going from learning to trust adults all the way to the other end of the spectrum by attempting to learn how to foster that trust with his own child. And unfortunately, his grand finale in this world would be caused by Jotaro prioritizing the safety of Jolene rather than dealing with Enrico Pucci. It's an incredibly tragic but appropriate end for this slow burn character. And of course, he is assumedly reincarnated into the universe because Irene mentions her father and who knows what became of this new Jotaro and how he differs from his previous self. That is an evolution that we will sadly probably never get to explore, but it's also not one that we really need to see. And so over the course of four of these eight parts, Jotaro has displayed immense growth and it has been pretty incredible to watch his life cycle play out with the only other comparable character being Joseph, who is another fascinating examination, but not one for today. But in conclusion, I just want to say that I do somewhat regret any time that I have described Jotaro as flat, when in fact he does very much present one of the most enduring and radically shifting characters in the series. Although let's be real, most of that does take place after his tenure as a main character, so it doesn't necessarily fix any issues I have with Stardust Crusaders. But what do you guys think? Please do let me know down in the comments below or even join my Discord server. And if you're keen for some more Jojo content, then please go and check out some of my other videos or even subscribe to the channel for regular Jojo Wonder delivered straight into your YouTube feed. But for now, this has been the New World Review and I'll see you next time.